everybody. So, um, I'm back after six years. I had the honor of speaking at the very first uh, Build May uh, back in 2014. Um, I was selling my new book then, which is why I'm now a best-selling author. Uh, and um, it was a great event. I made some new friends, but uh, it's nice. To, it's nice to finally be back. So. I write books about planning. I, I do planning. I have a very specific talk to give today. Well, let me ask, who is, who is, here, in, who is here in 2014? Raise your hand. Okay. So maybe about a third of you. There's going to be a, there's going to be, which is good because about a third of my talk overlaps from <laughs> that talk. Um, but in conversations with Kara and others, uh, it became clear that we really need to focus on just one aspect. Uh, focusing more sharply on the safety aspect of the walk of the city. So my talk is really going to be fo focused mostly on that one category. And for that reason, and since I'm going to be talking about lanes and pavement and signals, which is also very boring, right? I thought that I, it won't be, but I thought that, that I, I, I had an obligation to tell you a little bit more about, about my work and the other stuff I do. So um, just FYI, because I won't be talking, uh, and then of course because I grew up in DPZ, the founders of the New Urbanism, I had the pleasure of working on a whole bunch of their great projects, uh, including Kent Lanes in Washington, Rosemary Beach in Florida, um, Loreto Bay in Mexico. Uh, this is pronounced Hunebu, it's in Belgium. We did it with Leon Creer. Uh, and then I also, I also get to design buildings now and then, like this one at Rosemary Beach. Um, this is a parking garage where we broke out the stair element as its own civic building um, in Wine Ranch, New York, and, and houses. So this is, this is the, the more designy stuff I get to do, which I won't be talking to you about today. Today I'm going to be talking to you about one part of the law of the city. And um, it's important, though, that, that I begin by talking about why these design issues regarding the safety of our communities are so important. Uh, so, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on why the lockable city is so, so, so necessary. I basically do two types of talks. I can talk about why we need the lockable city and about how to do the lockable city. I'll be dealing with, I'll be working on both of those issues uh, today, but in terms of why we need it, um, I describe in lockable city the experience of being a city planner and having argued for walkability, kind of from a design perspective for many years and seeing a limited reaction and a limited uptake and limited progress in response to these sort of design-oriented, planning-oriented, aesthetic arguments that we used to make for more walkable cities. And, and the, the slow revolution that dawned on my colleagues and me over the past couple of decades was that there were three other groups that were arguing much more effectively for walkable cities than we were. Uh, with data, and they were the economists, the environmentalists, and the epidemiologists. And so actually the first three chapters of Block of the City, and still ideas that I stress in my, in my work, are the things that we learned from them, and some very powerful arguments about why it's so important that we make our communities uh, more walkable. So let's begin, and this will just be quick, just a quick summary, but let's begin with the economists. Um, we're reminded that uh, in 1970, the typical American spent 10% of their income on transportation. And since 1970 and, and uh, 2010, we actually about doubled the number of roads in the US. And what that achieved was we doubled the percentage of our income that we spend on transportation. We made the decision to, to uh, link our entire transportation system around this idea of everyone driving a car everywhere. And what it's done, even though we, mo we move no faster than we used to from place to place on average, thanks to traffic and other reasons, but we now actually have to dedicate twice as much of our income to transportation. Working Americans, according to the, um, the, the federal government, are spending, uh, and that's a category, working Americans, uh, are spending as much on transportation as they are on housing. And poor Americans are spending about 40% of their income on transportation because of this, this situation we've created. 
Now that's the individual spending, but how about the governments? Because in fact, there's all these hidden costs, and I'm sure you know about this. There's all these hidden costs behind our roadways, um, which we don't pay, but which government pays and which society pays. And this chart, <clears throat> which was produced a few years ago, tries to tries to to get the numbers right. And I'm sure it's I'm sure it's off a little, but it's not off it's not off by a lot. And essentially, if walking costs you a dollar, society pays a penny. Now, I was trying to figure out why walking would cost you a dollar. Maybe it's the sneakers or something. And I guess what the, what the penny is is the sidewalks and that sort of infrastructure. Cycling, society pays eight cents for bike lanes and other stuff. Now, transit is subsidized. It's subsidized a dollar fifty for your dollar on average. But driving is over nine dollars for every dollar you spend. And when you think about the infrastructure we create, to support driving, it makes total sense. <laughs> you know, the, to put a sidewalk or a bike lane in this environment would be just a rounding error. But of course, there are all the other costs that we don't think about immediately. The, in, the indirect costs, like the climate change, the investment in, in foreign wars to support our oil addiction, um, and of course, uh, the hospitals, the graveyards, um, that we need to figure into that number. Now, that's kind of the sad story. The happy story is the demand that exists for walkable places. There's a huge mismatch, the economists tell us, like Chris, Lin Chris Leinberg. There's a huge mismatch in our society between the kind of environments that people want to live in and the kind of physical environment we've built over the last 50 years. So that people pay a tremendous premium for walkable places. And that's why, actually, if you make more of them or if you make your places more walkable, they will attract more wealth and be more prosperous. So Chris Leinberger, um, in this great book, The Option of Urbanism, he uses walk score <clears throat> to divide the landscape into what he calls walkable urban places and drivable suburban places. And then using that metric, what he finds is a tremendous premium for walkability everywhere you look. Even in Detroit, right, where the inner city was so disparaged for so many years, People were paying a 51% premium for square footage in, in walkable urban versus drivable suburban. In Denver, that, that premium is 150%. In New York City, that premium is 200%. So actually, the apartment in Greenwich Village, you're paying three times as much per square foot as, as the house in Greenwich. You know, and for many, this is the American dream. But the fact is that people would rather be here than here in terms of what they're paying for. And so that's a positive economic benefit. There's a lot more on that, but let's move on to what the environmentalists are telling us. And this was a bit of a revelation. In fact, it was a kind of a U-turn. That, that, you know, when we, when we environment, environmentalism in the past 15 years or so has become about carbon and climate appropriately. And the, the maps that we saw about <clears throat> carbon per square mile look like this. And they look a lot like you know, a night sky photo of the U.S. You know, they're hottest in the cities and cooler in the suburbs and coolest in the countryside. And so that kind of reinforced this, this historic American message that actually cities were bad for the environment. And the history of the environmental movement in the U.S. has been an anti-city movement. Until um, an economist said, is this really the right way to measure carbon? Because you know, square mile actually doesn't do it. Because there are only so many of us in the U.S. at a given time that we can choose to live in the place where we have the least carbon uh, footprint. And so let's not measure per square mile, let's measure per household. This happens to be Chicago. We have these maps for every city. When you measure carbon contribution per household instead of per square mile, the maps just flip entirely 180 degrees. Coolest in the cities, <coughs> the warmer in the suburbs, hottest in the exodus. So now it's very clear that we have two choices. We can make our suburbs more like cities, or we can move. And I often tell people, you know, just move. Don't, where you live may be hopeless. Just move to a place where you can have a, a smaller footprint. Because, you know, this is the way that most of us contribute principally. As individuals, right, as individuals and families, the way that we contribute most to climate change is our driving. And so where we live has the biggest impact on that. This chart, you've probably seen some version of it. They've been around for about 30 years. This happens to be for San Francisco, LA, and Chicago. 
but you can map any American city, any global city, and you get the same curve that as density increases, vehicle miles traveled drops. You can also map every city in the world, and they will trace this curve. What's really fascinating though is, look, I mean, basically this is, Amsterdam is here, and Hong Kong is here. And the difference between Amsterdam and Hong Kong is almost zero. But what matters is when you get from suburban to rural densities to urban densities, because this is where you go from a more automotive landscape to a more walkable traditional landscape. And so that's what really matters is the first, you know, when you get to about 20 units per acre, that's a normal urban, you know, mixed urban density, row houses, apartments, single family houses. And that's about as far as you need to go, frankly, to have a huge impact. And then finally, the epidemiologists, and I always say that um, <clears throat> August 7th, 2004 was the best day in, in America to be a planner, because that's when this book came out. And these three epidemiologists said, actually, it's, it's two epidemiologists and a planner. The planner's the cute one. Um, <laughs> said, the reason, these are doctors, right? They're saying the reason why we have the first generation of Americans who are expected to live, to live shorter lives than their parents. And the reason why one third of all children born in the US after 2000 are expected to become diabetic is because we've designed out of existence the useful law in our communities. Diet matters, but um, actually uh, activity matters just as much. And of course, obesity isn't the problem. It's all the things that obesity causes or makes worse. Um, and they show, I got this slide, which, this slide's been around for 20 years, but I got it from an epidemiologist, who, uh, Larry Frank, who's been, or actually, sorry, uh, Howard, Howard Funkin, who, should, who, you know, he's a doctor, and he shows this slide, and he says, you know, the fact that you can drive to park, to take the escalator to the gym, to get on the treadmill, to walk, is why we have a morbid society. And, and so we need to fix that as well. And then there's car crashes also. Huge impact on health, the greatest killer of healthy people, um, in, in the world, um, and you can see how the United States is the worst in the world in terms of death per 100,000 population, uh, and then because we drive more. If you break it down for 100 uh, vehicle miles traveled, then the quality of the roads becomes more of an issue, but we just have to drive so much more, so we're dying in cars so much more, and it's, and it's city by city. So if your city is older and designed around walking and transit, it's not that bad. If your city is designed around, or has been remade around cars, like Dallas, or made almost entirely from the beginning around cars, like Orlando, you can see how the death rates change. So these are really important health issues based on being more walkable. So that, that's some of the argument. I have a longer TED talk I'll direct you to at the end, which spends 15 minutes on these three topics. Um, let's now get into how to do it. And you know, when I give my talks, I describe what I call my general theory of walkability, which asks this question about how do we get people to make the choice to walk in our societies, and, and you know, in America, particularly where driving is so easy and so cheap, and you don't pay the full cost of it by a long shot, as we saw, and the car is sitting there in the driveway between you and everything. It's so easy to fall into it. If people are gonna make the choice to, drive, to walk instead of driving, the walk has to satisfy four criteria at once, and you can't skip any of them. Uh, the walk has to be useful, which has to do, of course, with having a reason, uh, a reason to walk in, having a different use to walk to. Uh, the walk has to be safe, which I'll talk about more. It has to be comfortable, in the sense that the streets, streets and other public spaces are well shaped by buildings that hold their edges and make them feel like what we call outdoor living rooms, and it needs to be interesting which is essentially hiding your parking structures, hiding your blank walls, or making lovely murals, uh, and also avoiding repetition. But today I'm only going to talk about this category. I have plenty of other talks available where I talk about the other three, which are more about design and, and more, more subtle. Um, but the safe walk is interesting because it's actually the one that you can influence immediately and dramatically, particularly in your city. And, you know, the, the reason to walk, the comfortable walk, and the interesting walk are all a function, principally a function of the buildings that are lining the street. And cities can control that in the long term with zoning and with investment. 
But actually, in the short term, they can, they can fix their streets tomorrow, unless the DOT stops them. But the DOT can also fix those same streets, and I'm really glad that Maine, Maine God is here. I'll be talking about them as well later. So, let's get into the same walk. Everything I'm going to talk to today goes back to this diagram, which is essentially that you're, you're about, a, a car going 35 miles an hour is about eight times as likely to kill you as a car going 25 miles an hour. And this is the threshold that cars are, are wandering around in our cities, right? They tend to be driving close to 25, close to 35. Whether they're at the upper end or the lower end of that scale is almost entirely a function of the built environment. It's not like on highways where you can put up speed limits that determine how fast people go. Because the speed limit sign is how people determine their speeds on highways. In urban areas, that's completely wrong. And in fact, engineers who are designing urban areas like speed limits actually matter. When in fact what matters are all the clues that the landscape is providing that's making people feel safe driving faster or not as safe driving faster. So what are those things? What are, the, what, are the, what are the things that create the friction that cause drivers to go speeds which are less likely to kill pedestrians, cyclists, and each other? And I want to mention before, before getting into that, <clears throat> it's not just that getting hit at a higher speed is more dangerous. You're also more likely to be hit when cars are going at a higher speed because the cone of vision of the driver narrows and they see a lot less of what's in front of them. So, what creates friction? The first thing is block size. The smaller the block, generally the safer the city. This is Port the other Portland in Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200 foot blocks. This is Salt Lake City, famously not as walkable, uh, 600 foot blocks. This is my family crossing a street in Salt Lake City where they actually have a bucket with red flags in it that you can pick up and wave so you don't get plowed down because a 600-foot uh, block city is basically a six-lane city. And here you see Portland on the left and Salt Lake City on the right. And you know, these are five to six-lane roads throughout the city. This is a study of 24 different California cities. As the block size about doubles, the non-highway fatal crashes almost quadruples. So it's an important factor. <clears throat> Maine is blessed with many Downtowns, most of your original downtowns, you know, kind of medieval in their, in their origin, the way that they're laid out. Um, and they actually even are, are smaller in their grid than Portland, the kind of blocks that you see in, in Bangor, in, in Portland. Um, right, here's, here's Bangor next to Portland. See this wonderful, delicate fabric, which means that the downtown at least has the potential to be very walkable. Right, it's good bones, that's what we call it. Right, you can, you can, it doesn't mean you necessarily walk because of all the other factors, but at least you know walkability is possible. Now there's parts of every city also in Maine that has managed to sprawl at all, like Portland uh, or Augusta, where, you know, walkability isn't possible no matter what you do to the streets, because the blocks are too, are too big. So we call that bad bones, but more accurately, it's just the wrong bones, right? It's the auto-oriented cul-de-sac collector sprawl bones that, that just don't even try here. Now you can make it safer in all sorts of ways, but don't think these will ever be walkable environments because they were never intended to be. But when you have a good block system like this, the main lesson to learn is, you know, don't super block, don't eliminate streets, don't allow your blocks to get, to, to get bigger. Next, as I've implied, is the number of lanes. The more lanes, that, and this, this, uh, this applies to highways, but it also applies to local streets. And on local streets, of course, where you're going to try to cross, the more lanes there are, the more dangerous the street is, always. And I'm always, I'm always surprised when you hear about, about cities and DOTs adding lanes to make streets safer. And I hear that every day. I heard it last year in Colorado Springs. Oh, we're adding two lanes to the street. We're gonna, that'll make it safer. That's never, ever happened in the history of streets. But people still say that. <clears throat> now, we've been showing this for 25 years, but I won't stop because as I'm about to show you, no one's listened. Or the people that listen aren't in charge. Uh, this is 
ideal traffic planning. When the number of trips on the street exceed the capacity of the street, the difference equals congestion. The idea is that you widen the street to absorb those trips and the congestion goes away, which is a wonderful theory. It has never, ever happened in congested systems. Because in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. And it is induced traffic. These are the trips that the congestion was stopping that then appear when the congestion removed, is removed. So people move further away from their jobs. People start commuting more on peak. And by the way, this is a very main thing. In your smaller communities, or in your typical communities, which aren't that large, what you really get when you increase the road capacity is a more point of a rush. You, get, you shorten your rush hour. When your capacity is tight or lessened, your rush hour attenuates. But really what's happening in cities like yours is that the number of roads you have determined, the number of lanes you have is determining how long or short your rush hour is. But the congestion, which is the only deterrent to driving, is the constant. And once you've got it, you've always got it. And you can widen and widen all you want. So I read this in Newsweek magazine. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. And I read this and I jumped through joy. And then I landed and I said, who are these engineers, man? Please meet some of them. Now, in fact, everything I'm telling you about traffic, I learned from engineers. And there's a bunch of great engineers out there who understand this. But the typical engineer and city official and state official and federal official still thinks, oh, we need to widen that. And frankly, the public thinks we need to widen that street because traffic is coming. And then, of course, the street gets wide and the traffic comes. And they say, see, I told you we needed that extra width. So here's a study that was presented at the Paris School of Economics, very straightforward. Actually, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> but I do know what this means, which is that all the data shows that the new capacity you put on a road with it is 40% absorbed by new trips immediately and 100% absorbed within four years, or immediately. So this is the uh, 405 in LA, one of several examples where a tremendous investment was made in adding a lane or two to a highway that opened up to more congestion than it closed to, and it never got better. And we're finding this over and over again, everywhere we look. And so you say, Jeff, this is old news. We've heard this before. But maybe they haven't heard it before in Maine, because the Turnpike Pike Authority is approving the widening of a, of a bunch of highways or at least a bunch of I-95 in Maine, and say, oh, well, they must be justified. Everyone knows about induced demand. They could be justifying it by induced demand. Why are the highways presently the most effective way to resolve moving congestion and safety problems? And don't feel bad. We see this everywhere. You see it in Texas. You see it in Maryland right now. The governor of Maryland, who's an idiot, just said, <laughs> just said that they have to widen the highways to solve um, climate change. <laughs> because congestion is causing you know, exhaust. In fact, the most congested cities in America, listen to this carefully, because this is shocking when I heard it. The most congested cities in America have the least contribution to climate change. And the cities that contribute the most have the least congestion. It's cars moving that are the problem. So, I'll move on, because, you know, you can, you can say this all you want, and people just ignore you, but I just want to, I want to go on record. You have two choices in Maine, if you're widening I-95 through Maine. You're either ignorant, or you're wrong. And now you're not ignorant, because you've heard this, and so you're just wrong. Okay, so, I always move on, because that argument's so hard to win, and say, okay, where are the opportunities to, to make streets safer that don't reduce, that don't reduce uh, throughput, that don't reduce capacity? Because there you can win, because you're not, no, one, no, one's, no one has to say, oh, there's going to be more congestion after I make this change. And the great opportunity here and elsewhere that, that we find in many communities is the four to three lane diet, where you take this and you turn it into this, generating uh, either extra parking lane or bike lanes. Um, and, you know, this is very dangerous. And I'll show you why in a minute, but um, when you remove 
the two turn lanes, which are also the fast lane, and you replace it with one turn lane, not only do you gain 11 feet, of course, but you reduce the number of conflict points. And no one is surprised to find that the street becomes much safer. Right? You go from six conflict points to three conflict points. And you also have this condition where people are rushing in a fast lane, but then they have to jam on the brakes because it's also a turning lane. But this is the part that surprises everybody. This is, a, this is a, a study, and this is 23 of them. There are a lot more now. Road diets, four lanes to three line lanes across North America. The, the throughput of the road, the average traffic before and after, effectively is unchanged. So the big surprise is that when you make the streets safer and you gain 10 or 11 feet for bike lanes or whatever you want them for, um, you actually do not reduce the capacity of the street at all. So that's why these have been so effective spreading around the U.S. Um, there are, you know, your larger cities have these streets. There's Lisbon Street, or at least a little bit outside of downtown here in Portland. There's Congress Street. There's Forest Avenue. For the price of paint, these could be fixed tomorrow. So low-hanging fruit. The next issue that's relevant to many of your cities is one-way streets. Sometimes people intuitively think one-way streets are safer because you only have to look one way before you cross. But in fact, the data is quite the opposite. Now I'm talking about multi-lane one-way streets, the streets in many of our communities that used to be two-way. Right? They all used to be two-way. This is one in Davenport, Iowa, where my wife is from. Um, you know, what is it that makes it so unsafe? Certainly, you know, the, the platooning of all these cars next to each other, the sheer the sheer, you know, the sheer momentum of all these vehicles going the same way, the fact there's less friction of opposing traffic to cause people to slow down. Um, I'm kind of convinced that the principal thing that makes it more dangerous is the ability to jockey. Also in the four lane streets I showed you a minute ago. <clears throat> when you have an extra lane to choose from, when you have two lanes to choose from, you become a different sort of driver. Unless you have no aggressive bones in your body at all. But if you're, I think if you're, a, if you're a normal person, you, you want to be in the faster lane, because why not? And you take advantage of that, and you, start, you stop looking around for pedestrians, you stop looking in the store windows, and you start trying to find the faster lane, and going faster. So the data is really interesting. We probably have data on four or five of these now. Um, a recent study was done in Louisville, Kentucky, where these four streets, Brooks, first, second, and third, were all one way. Um, Brooks and First were reverted to two-way, second and third were kept as one way. On the two-ways, car crashes dropped by about half and crime even went down by a quarter. The one-ways, car crashes went up and crime even went up. And there's data like this coming in now from many different cities. Um, about half an hour from, or even less from Louisville is New Albany, Indiana, where I did this plan where we took an almost entirely one way downtown core and reverted it to uh, almost entirely two way. And uh, it sat idle for three years and then last summer they just did it all. And there was a lot of citizen support. Uh, these signs were printed up and were in the front yards the second time I visited, kind of as an outcome of the lecture I gave the first time I visited. And um, you can have your very own so if you have one ways in your community, uh, Kara and her team have printed up at cost, uh, the, uh, have printed up these signs, they're selling them at cost for $15. I don't know how many they have, but you should, you should, find, you should stay in touch and get them, you know, I wanna see hundreds of them being produced and sold in the weeks ahead because you all have communities where, well, many of you come from communities where this could happen. Um, another project, I did about seven years ago was downtown Cedar Rapids. Uh, I just saw this newspaper article last week. They've, they've pretty much finished all the, all, converting all the one ways downtown back to two way. And they had this neat little toggle on the website from before to after. It's kind of fun. The cones are temporary. But notice we added protected bike lanes. And, and we right sized it to the amount of traffic that was on it. So the other thing you can do. You can't take away, it's very difficult politically to take away capacity on a street that's, that's 
that's experiencing tremendous traffic. These streets were sized for the farm boom, then there was the farm bust, and they had many more lanes than the traffic on them. So we were able to reduce the number of lanes, but um, it's really fun to see that happen in there. And then of course you have many conditions of these one-way pairs, often state roads, uh, like in Waterville where you have um, Main 100, two one-way pairs. In Lewiston you have Canal and Lisbon. Bangor has, a, has some, Portland has a bunch, Augusta has them. Uh, but then don't confuse them with this, right? These are the streets, this one's in Bath, this one's in Portland. These are not dangerous streets because there's no jockeying lane, right? It's tight. It's the multi-lane one-ways that you can and should fix as soon as possible. Next is the lane, the width of the lanes themselves. Andre Swanee has shown this slide for many years, and he used to say, the width of a typical street to the typical subdivision in America is now enough for you to witness the curvature of the earth, which is <laughs> visible in this slide. And there's been this creep. So here's a street from the 80s, here's a subdivision from the, the 60s, and here's a subdivision from the 80s. Same height of airplanes, same houses, same size of houses, but look, look what's happened before and after. Because there's been just this mission creep. This is my old neighborhood in, in South Beach in Miami. When the street wasn't draining properly and they had to rebuild it, even though it was perfectly functional before, this new standard kicks in, we lost our street trees and half our sidewalk. And what happens in faster lanes? Wider lanes, excuse me. Wider lanes are faster lanes. Um, the engineers know this, they'll tell you this. A, a 12 foot lane, which is a highway lane, is a 70 mile an hour lane. A 10 foot lane is an urban lane, it's more of a 40 mile an hour or less lane. Here's, a, here's one of many charts that map vehicle speeds against lane width. Um, many studies have documented this, and citizens understand it. They often fight for narrower streets in their communities. And then when we build new communities, this is one called Ion that we built outside of uh, Charleston. You know, we, we build them. This is a, a not commercial, not usually significant, right? Local street of single family houses. Streets like this can be built with lanes that are much narrower, that are shared lanes. They're called queuing lanes, ideally 12 feet, that handle traffic in both directions. This is the kind of streets many of us grew up on. The developer of Instagram, who is a very good public speaker, he goes to conferences, he shows this street in Ion, and he reminds us of this philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. And um, this plays very well in the South, as you so, um, so you have these, right? In your older neighborhoods, you have these streets. And you should be allowed to build more. When you build new communities, you've got to make sure that you have this skinny street standard. But the, um, what's really important to talk about are your, are your downtown streets. And bless their hearts, NACDO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, has finally come out and made it clear that 10 feet are appropriate. 10 foot lanes are, are the, now the standard for city streets. It doesn't matter who owns it, the DOT owns it, the city owns it, 10 feet is the appropriate width. And of course, you have examples, like here, you have plenty of examples where it works quite fine. The Main Street of Bar Harbor, one of the reasons why people, reasons why people like to be here, is it's 8, 10, 10, 8, 36 feet, your classic Main Street measurement. Uh, but then you've got a lot of other examples where there's just too much elbow room. So Main Street in Saka should be 36, it's 43. So you have an extra seven feet. Maybe you put in a one-way one bike lane. Uh, Union Street in Portland should be 36, it's 44. Then 4th Street, named after the restaurant, um, <laughs> should be named 45 Street because it's got an extra nine feet in it. So these are things you can fix and quickly with paint. We used to design inter intersections like this, with a very tight curve radius. This is probably a six inch curve radius. So that when you cross a 20 foot street, you're actually walking 20 feet. The standard in many communities is this, maybe a 40 foot or a 35 foot curve radius. So the car doesn't have to slow down and you're crossing a width which is much wider than the street itself. I've been told that when an intersection particularly in rural areas where two streets cross, two state, 
two state highways cross, which in your rural areas are the principal streets. And when there's collisions at those intersections, one of the typical DOT solutions is to broaden the intersection, to daylight it, to make, it, make greater visibility. That makes sense on a highway where people's speeds are being determined by the posted speed limit. And you just want to have as, as free flowing a speed as possible so that if they make mistakes, they don't hit things. But again, at intersections where there's houses and people around, the people's speed is determined by the geometry of the roadway. So when you widen an intersection to make it safer, you're actually increasing the risk of injury and death at that intersection. And this is what cities are doing, like Chicago. This is like the sort of tactical urbanism efforts that we saw here yesterday, where you, you know, trucks still need to make the corner, so how many posts and how much construction you can actually put in is limited, but with paint and other techniques, you can neck down intersections. This is how you make intersections safer in places where people are. And then you have things like Main Street here in Lewiston, which we'll be walking around on later, and um, just these very swoopy geometries. And here you have basically a T intersection, but we still have the slip lane, which is a highway detail. It's not an urban detail, because it allows you to swoop around the corner without slowing down. You can see it here. A lot of cities, like this is Midtown Atlanta, they're closing their slip lanes. This is after, this is before, this is after. In urban areas, slip lanes are not appropriate and need to go away, like here. So, what do we do? <laughs> we show them, you have, a, you have a difficult condition here in Maine, like in many places, but it's particularly here in Maine, where your main streets your, your highways, when they come into your towns, become the main streets. But they're still highways. And that's why you get conditions like this. And look how swoopy it is and how, how high speed these geometries are. And if you remember nothing else from my talk today, I want you to remember this diagram. It was done by Paul Moore at Nelson Nigar. And we talked about, talk about the 20 minute commute and the 20 minute 48 second commute. Because most people's commute is not through downtown, and there's only a small distance, maybe three quarters of a mile, where you're actually in that walkable urban core of the downtown. And the point of this image is to say that if we lower the effective speed limit in that area from 45 to 25, we're only adding 48 seconds to the commute because it's such a small, it's such a small part of the commute. And this is what context-sensitive design is about. It's about state DOTs accepting that when their highways pass through the centers of communities, they will ignore the old manual, which is all about increasing safety on highways by reducing friction, and look at the new manual, which is all about increasing safety in cities, which is about increasing friction, increasing opportunities to bump into things, because then you're not gonna bump into people. So I couldn't help but notice, you know, different Different DOTs, you know, there's M dots and D dots. I was wondering why you guys spell it out, main dot. But then I did a little anagram work and moved the A and then the D and the O, and I figured it out. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I know that they're here. They were here the first time, they come every time. That makes main dot better than almost every other DOT in the country. They show up, they're listening. I know the, yeah. the last year they're coming, but the, the, the point is that you know, they're, they're listening to you, but I want them to listen to me. And I want them to look at this diagram and just give us these things back. Like, no, don't give them, like keep them, but understand that yes, your communities in Maine, in order to thrive and to have the economies that will allow you to keep repairing your bridges and filling your potholes, they need to be safe. And the way to make them safe is to throw out the old manual and listen to your local city planners and local engineers when it comes to the design of, of, of downtown streets. So, 
Moving on. A new trick since last time I spoke to you. We discovered that when you remove the center line from the street, people drive seven miles an hour slower. So here's something you can use in your communities. Seven miles an hour is the difference between the top drive and the bottom drive in many different, well, six different locations. Um, and then you have this, and I had never heard this term before. Who's heard of advisory lanes? Okay, I learned it yesterday from Kara. This is brilliant. I don't know what this width is. Does anyone in the room know what this width is? I'm guessing it's 20 feet. No, but it's not the whole thing's 25. So this is 15. This is what you would call a, uh, a slow flow, not really a yield flow, because you can fit two cars in 15, but they have to slow down, right? This is brilliant. I'm going to show this everywhere. But on rural roads, this makes complete sense. There's no reason not to do it everywhere. Now, signals. <clears throat> this is not a roundabout signal. This is art. Um, but it reminds us of a problem in the U.S., which is we have two, sorry, go ahead, get your picture. <laughs> um, we have too many signals. In many cities, the same companies that tell, the same consultants that tell you where to put your signals then sell you the signals. And that's one reason why we have too many signals. And the studies are now completed. In Philadelphia, they had to remove 472 signals when the Lawrence rules changed. And they tested 199 of the signals and they found Changing signals to four-way or always stop signs, crashes went down by 24%, severe injury crashes went down 63%, severe pedestrian injury crashes went down more than two-thirds. This is funny. Traffic injuries in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefits stem from the elimination of the local habit of speeding up to beat the red, because we do that here in Philadelphia. Um, this is a study I recently, part of a study I recently did for Albuquerque, New Mexico. I recommended closing, I think, reverting, I think, 19 signals to stop signs. They've reverted about 11 of them. Uh, interestingly enough, to reduce not just speeding, but what they, they, they found that there's less traffic congestion. Because, yes, you have to stop at every intersection, but you're never sitting and waiting. So it's a good technique. Here's an example in Gardner where it was done. Is this still here, or did they revert it back? Still there, probably because it's safer. Technically, the data suggests it's safer. And then, of course, the ridiculous push buttons that never work anywhere, that do nothing but, but disappoint you, um, and that generally mean that there's a signalization regime at the intersection which is anti-pedestrian. You know, pedestrians should never have to ask for a light. If it's any place that has any significant pedestrian flow at all, then the pedestrian cycle should just be part of the cycle. And cities are getting rid of these. Thank you. Um, which reminds me that you know the four-way stop, which by the way, I've seen four-way stops on six-lane roads working just fine. The four-way stop can handle a ton of traffic. The four-way stop is a much safer solution than any signalization solution. And this whole new smart cities thing where they're gonna get they're gonna sell you. They're going to convince you to, 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 to apply for federal and state funding to get some money so you can put these smart signals in your intersection. They won't work as well as a stop sign. So I say don't do it. Cycling I talked about last time, but it's, you know, it's the biggest planning revolution currently underway in only some American cities, like Portland, where they've invested in it. And the key to cycling population is to invest in cycling. Other things matter, but nothing quite as much. And you now know that the protected bike thing Parking parked cars is pulled off the curb to protect it is the gold standard. Uh, this is in Pittsburgh, this is in Chicago. Um, in New York City, when they turn this three laner into a two laner by introducing this protected bike lane, the uh, number of cyclists, of course, tripled, speeding, of course, dropped precipitously, injury crashes to all users, including drivers, dropped precipitously, and the road handles as many cars per hour with two lanes as it used to with three. Because people were just speeding from red light to red light before. So this being New York, of course, there was a five-year lawsuit. Eventually, the bike-hating Mindy Trolls gradually surrendered to reality. And I show this picture to contrast it with this picture, because, you know, this used to be good enough, right? But no one wants their daughter in the door zone. And the problem isn't just the doors, it's like, you need something protecting the
the, the lane from everything that goes in the lane, the Amazon trucks, the Ubers, the trash can. You know, people are always putting something in the bike lane. <laughs> and God help us. And this is why we need to protect our lanes as you were just beginning to do here. But don't, you know, don't think it's not important. You know, businesses really demand it. There's this perception that this, this guy, the mammal, the middle-aged male in Lycra, is your target audience. <laughs> but that's who you get if you don't have bike lanes. This is your audience. And even more so, this is your audience. And people think that urban biking is elitist. But in fact, among those people who commute on bicycles, fully 39% of bike commuters are from the poorest 25% of Americans. So don't, don't let anyone tell you that bike lanes are elitist. They're serving the kitchen workers, factory workers, and the people who, who don't have the opportunity to drive. Um, weather matters. This is Helsinki, not Portland. Um, actually, I think it's Copenhagen. Weather matters, but this is a chart from the warmest state to the coldest state. You're here. And this line that has nothing to do with that is bike population. Because again, bike population is a function of, of investment more than weather. And a line I learned in Maine, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. Parallel parking, an essential barrier of steel that protects the curb from moving vehicles. This is happy hour in Fort Lauderdale. You can park on this side, of, sorry, you can park on this side of the street, you can't park on that side of the street. This is happy hour on the parked side of the street. This is happy hour on the unparked side of the street. No one wants to be on a sidewalk that isn't protected in some way. And we forget that. Street trees are the other part of the deal. Street trees, the data shows, a street with trees on it is safer. Your DOTs have historically thought of them as FHOs, fixed hazardous objects. But just, uh, the studies now show that there are, there are fewer injury crashes on streets with trees because trees slow cars down, sometimes dramatically. But <laughs> better a tree getting hit than a pedestrian, which is what can happen if you don't have one. And this is a European artist's depiction of, of that street that doesn't have the trees, doesn't have the parked cars. Plenty of DOT streets in Maine look like this. I'm sorry, there are trees, <laughs> just very small ones. But the, par the lack of parallel parking is, is, is why the sidewalk doesn't feel safe and why businesses will never succeed in a location like that. So what do you do? You restrike. And I'm finishing up, but you know, I go to cities and I say, don't rebuild. Rebuilding is super expensive. You wait five years for a federal grant, and you know, it's not worth it. You could just restrike tomorrow. And there's a lot of streets that you should restrike tomorrow. But then, every now and then, I see an example that convinces me otherwise. So this is Lancaster, California. Five lane road. They invested, I think, $11 million, $11.2 million, and did this to it. Amazing, right? Beautiful. A lot of money. Well, that $11 million generated, well, first of all, crashes went down by half. Pedestrian crashes went down by more than three quarters. Pedestrian activity doubled. That activity led to 57 new businesses opening, 800 new housing units being developed, 2,000 new jobs, and an economic impact predicted at $282 million in the last decade. So maybe it is worth making the investment, picking your key street and rebuilding to make it more like a plaza that happens to have cars on it with very low speed geometrics. So that was the safe walk, and um, that's all I'm going to talk about today, which is why I'm done. I want to leave you with some resources. First, this is the book I was flogging when I was here last. Thank you all for buying it and reading it. But now you need another book, which is this book. So this is the book, this is the book for readers. It's great. If you want to get someone interested in these issues, give them this book. It's fun to read. It has sold really well because it's just a, it's just a fun you know, piece of literary nonfiction. But um, people would go to meetings, and I have pictures. You know, people are at meetings, they're holding the book up, and they're shouting. <laughs> but it isn't enough because it, it isn't a manual that has the, the diagrams, the photographs, the da enough data. And so this book, Lockable City Rules, is a toolkit. 
I say it weaponizes walkable scenic deployment in the field. Uh, as soon as this is over, I will not be stopping in the aisle to chat with you because I'm going to be running to the book table to welcome you so I can talk to you there and sign this book. But honestly, this is the only book. It has all five-star reviews on Amazon except one person got a wet book in the mail and gave it one star. So my book arrived wet and ruined my rating. Okay. Uh, this is one TED Talk that is how to do it. This is the other TED Talk, which is why to do it. Um, just look up my name at TED, Jeff Speck with a K. And then two weeks from now, you guys are local. You can get there cheaply. Two weeks from now, I'm teaching my, um, I'm teaching my annual two-day class at Harvard, which is two days of this, including a wonderful studio exercise, the second day with George Proakis, the Bill Main speaker, Who's, uh, who's the director of planning at Somerville. Um, and this is a really great class. It's, it's Harvard, so it's not cheap. But honestly, when you're done, you get a piece of paper that looks like you graduated from Harvard. <laughs> so it's worth every penny. Um, so if you're interested in that, just let me know, and I'll make sure you get connected. Uh, and then finally, there's my website, uh, where you can find all these things. And I forgot to tell you not to take notes, because all of it's in the book. Um, but you didn't need to take notes. Uh, we have time for some questions, right, Karen? So thank you all for your attention, and thank you for coming to Bill Gates. Hey, I noticed you didn't talk about shared streets, so who knows, and I don't know what you about them. Shared streets and, and vunerfs are great. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're great. They're just, I've only worked on one of them that I could point to that actually was one of the first in America. Uh, that turned out very well, even though there were so few, because DOTs and public works engineers are afraid to stamp them. We need more so that there, that generates more. Um, I would contrast that with Shero's. I left out, I wanted to shorten my bicycle segment, so I left out my Shero segment. You know, the data on Shero's, which is a normal or slightly wide driving lane that happens to have a shared road symbol in it, uh, the data is that they're more dangerous than having no symbol at all. In fact, we, we invented a new symbol that looks like this, that's called a prayer row, um, <laughs> with the two arrows in the um, to replace it. But shared streets in which you have ideally no curb, you, you just pave with bricks or cobbles or something from building face to building face, in a narrow right of way where everyone mixes with a limited traffic flow, not on a highway. Um, those are often the safest streets of all. Yeah, so first of all, I have no studies. I just plagiarize other people's studies. Well, I give them credit, but I, I, you know, my job is to collect all this stuff up and share it in entertaining ways. Um, there's the whole naked streets phenomenon, which began in Europe with Hans Mondermann, who was a Dutch traffic engineer who worked mostly in Germany. Um, you know, but he, he would say, you know, then a street is, is dangerous. People always look to add something. And I say, what can we take away? and he would remove the signs and remove the markings and everything else. It's, it's part of the same center line discussion. You, weren't, you said you felt comfortable as a driver. You actually weren't supposed to feel that comfortable as a driver. You were supposed to feel uncertain. And the uncertainty that comes from not knowing exactly where your car ends and the car next to you begins um, is what made you drive a little bit more slowly than you would have driven otherwise. And, and certainly that's a, a trend which is slowly impacting the U.S. and it should be encouraged.
basically free, freeing up the streets to make them pedestrian friendly, so there's actually no cars on them. And you, you haven't addressed that at all. Um, would that impact economically uh, a street more than putting the change that you have, like you know, making it more street streets and pedestrian friendly? So a food stand of donor would be would that be more advantageous to have in cities rather than doing a construction and to change it? So, yeah, in, in Barcelona now, they're doing these, they call them mega blocks, but they're taking, you can imagine, a tic tac toe board, and they're taking all but the outer streets and making them these, you know, you can get a car on them to move or other reasons to move into your house, but principally through traffic isn't allowed. Um, the U.S. has a history of pedestrianizing about 210 main streets in the 60s and 70s. About three quarters of those died immediately. And the problem was that no one actually realized that those shops needed, those particular shops needed cars going by them, needed cars parking near them. The ones that survived and eventually thrived were the college towns and the resort towns, like you know, Lincoln Road in Miami, uh, a Church Street in um, Burlington, uh, you know, uh, in Charlottesville there's one, in Madison there's one. Um, but the, there's been a new generation of that happening in places like New York City where the shops don't need cars. So in New York City, whenever they've pedestrianized the street, it's performed better economically. So the lesson that we learned there isn't to not do it in your communities, but just to test it first. The big mistake they made in the 60s, 70s, was that they, they made an elaborate plan, they spent millions of dollars, mostly federal dollars, walling these streets off, putting in very expensive and expensive to remove street furniture, right? And then they found that it failed and then they were stuck with it. What New York City did, even though they had no reason to fear, what New York City did was they, they did it all temporarily. You know, you move in a couple planters and chairs and just, uh, Jeanette Sadekhan in New York went to Walmart and bought a bunch of Target and bought a bunch of chairs and just put them in the street. And, and then they tested it to see if it would work. Now in residential communities, there's no fear of right, the shop. I mean, in, a, in an all residential street, there's no fear of the shops failing. That's more of a practical issue among homeowners. And unfortunately, well, for whatever, people have a right to the neighborhoods they want. And most homeowners prefer the convenience of being able to get right to their homes. Um, but in retail areas, this trend has started again, and what concerns me is the people advocating for it in many cities are actually ignorant of the whole history of failure that occurred in the 80s. So um, it's important that you just test it as you go. Curious, is, is there any uh, data on the relationship to the size of streets and the size of cars? Size was in that one would encourage the other? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I travel to Kyoto to visit my son a lot. Tiny streets, tiny cars. So it's kind of a chicken, I guess it's a chicken and egg question. <laughs> I've never asked it, I don't know if answering it would benefit us in any way. But, um, you know, clearly, People use bigger cars. Like I was working in Oklahoma City, people always bring up the prospect of the dually. You guys know what a dually is? Yeah. Yes. You have duallys? You know, what about the dually? If someone makes the choice to buy a car that doesn't fit in your local streets, that's their mistake, right? You can't be reshaping your infrastructure around those decisions that people make. So that's the main comment I have there. We do one more? I saw their hands. I think we're going to make you run all the way to the back. I think cars. We're done. No, we're, okay, so we're going to stop. Thank you all so much, and I'll see you in the book too.